The following presentation is made possible, in part, by support from the Press Division and Taipei Cultural Center of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in New York and by the Government Information Office in Taiwan. Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, as part of our Taiwanese film series, it's our pleasure to present Darkness and Light by Chong Shouqi. Chong Shouqi is one of those filmmakers who's wished to look into the other side of Taiwan. Taiwan is, of course, famous for its enormous economic progress and its place in the Asian economic world. But this director in the neorealist tradition wants to look into the margins of the society. So if you're an admirer of people like De Sica or Rossellini, I think you're going to find this film to be a treat. And after today's film, you're also going to have the opportunity to meet the director. I had that chance myself as I made this interview in Taiwan. Now, peek into the corners of Taiwanese society in darkness and light. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see Darkness and Light, I think an extraordinary film from the recent Taiwanese uh, cinema. As I promised at the beginning of the show, we're uh, going to, in one sense, follow the format that we normally do, have a 30-minute discussion with someone quite pertinent to the film, but in another way, we're deviating from the format. And by deviation, I mean we are actually recording this conversation in Taipei, Taiwan. And it is my great pleasure to have with us today the director of the film, Chang so Chi. Chang so Chi, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with uh, the origins of this, uh, of this film. When did you start thinking about this film, and how did you come up with the idea for this film? My previous film's box office wasn't as successful as I had expected, so I was drinking a lot to the point of almost having a stroke. I went to a massage parlor often. Masseuses are often blind. One day, I waited a long time for my appointment. When the masseuse finally came, he told me he had been to a movie. I was surprised that blind people can go to a movie. I also noticed that he always turned on the light in the room. Why? I thought blind people can't see so they wouldn't need light. So I asked the masseuse about it, and he said, I turn the light for you, the customer. Then I came up with the idea of writing a script for blind people. I joked with my masseuse. One day, I may make a movie about blind people. Would you come to see it? He said not only would he go, he would be happy to play a part in that movie. So three years later, I made the movie Darkness and Light. At the movie premiere, I invited 200 blind people to be in the audience and a famous movie director, Wu Nanjian, to describe the visuals on the stage. I felt proud about this movie. My wish to help blind people had been realized. Many years ago, in Taiwan, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, 
there was a concept called healthy realism. Um, but your films have been called haunted realism. Um, this notion that they are concrete, they are very much here, but at the same time there's something else. The blind people who can experience the world in a, in a different way. Um, tell us about your concept of realism. Reality is not the same thing as realism. We write stories based on our real-life experiences. That's how we come up with compelling topics. In the movie-making process, we sometimes need to lose some actual details in order to enhance the movie's real impact. That's realism. That's why I need my audience to believe my story and all of the characters in my story within the first 30 seconds of seeing them. 30 seconds. That's the limit I set for myself. That's why, in my opinion, there is a line between reality and realism. To me, wandering along that line is challenging and fun, but it also can be dangerous. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your use of, of, of actors. Um, you like using people who are non-professionals. Um, non uh, the Chinese cinemas of the world have a very large uh, set now of, of stars. That's one kind of Chinese cinema. Uh, but clearly your vision of cinema uh, has a very different idea of the kinds of characters and how the actors relate to these characters. Talk to us a little bit about that. Regarding my use of non-professional actors, like I said before, I want my audience to believe my story and my characters within the first 30 seconds. This is a very important element of all my movies. In a movie theater, the screen is only a piece of cloth. You want the audience to believe everything you project onto that screen. My method to achieve this is by using real people who have never had any acting experience before. Of course, this is just one of the methods. I'd like to use professional actors as well, but first I need to challenge myself by working with non-professionals. Of course, to work with non-professional actors is full of difficulties that outsiders wouldn't realize. For example, by using these blind actors in Darkness and Light, our shooting location was very unusual. No cables could be lying around like they are now. All cables have to be taped down along the wall or perpendicularly. In every scene, we couldn't move a piece of furniture between takes, for example, a table. And we couldn't mark actors' positions because the blind can't see. The dialogue had to be different too. For example, you couldn't say, wait, can you bring that thing over? Because they can't see. They don't know what is this or that. You have to be very specific. The furniture can't be moved, including an actor's eating position. You can't move the table, even when there is no room for the camera to shoot. You have to knock down the wall to make room. Because when they sat down around the table, each blind person will carve a tiny mark at the corner of the table so he knows where to sit. When he sat down, he knew where the chopsticks were and how far outside the chopsticks his bowl lied. We also needed to train non-professional actors to work with these blind actors. The amount of time spent shooting was much longer. It usually took three times longer to shoot with a non-professional actor than with a professional one. Shooting darkness and light was a painful experience. For me, it's the ultimate test of the idea, why do I want to make films? All my enthusiasm for making films was tested in the process of creating this movie. You are not only interested in this film, in blind people, 
but in uh, all of your films, you are interested in some people that uh, others would describe as as marginal. This world of the of the criminal or of family and local organization that still exist in some important important way. Uh, you return to this world over and and over. Uh, what interests you uh, about it, and why the return? Mm. Let me answer your question in two parts. First of all, I am not interested in white-collar workers in a concrete jungle or Taipei's love story. In Taiwan, filmmaking is not considered a highly respected activity. I don't consider my characters as marginal minority people. They are all around me, and I am one of them. I just reflect what I see in my film. Secondly, I think all successful commercial films have the same common elements, a little violence, a little family problem, a little love, a little eating, and some teen problems. I present all these elements in my film, but in different proportions. I am a commercial filmmaker. I want to shoot commercial films. But when they come out, they may have the flavor of art films. Some people consider me an art filmmaker, but actually I am not. All these elements are plainly visible. I just combine them dramatically and rearrange them in my film. I hope my film sells at the box office, at least in Taiwan. So I don't deliberately pick certain subjects, no matter what the topic I choose, for example in Gangsters, The Blind, The Brothers, are all like that. Most of my characters are teenagers, young people. Because I think teenagers can be irresponsible, they are free to be that way. They can venture out. My films have a little flavor of violence, so these teenagers are good subjects. Uh, let's, let's continue a little bit with those things uh, that interest you. Uh, two features that I find absolutely uh, fascinating related to the kind of story and the kind of characters is where you choose to shoot, your choices of, lo of location, clearly not the concrete high-rises. But also, a, a second feature, it's not only just the visuals, uh, the texture of sound in your films, the language, but also the sound of the environments is, uh, I think, very important and adds to the total impact of the stories. Talk to us a little bit about how you design this or think about this. Mm. I feel that when I write, put it this way, when we shoot a movie, most of the time it's with a very low budget. It's very difficult to raise funds for my films because my backer has trouble investing in films that use unknown actors. Although he is famous right now, we really had humble beginnings. I know how tight the budget will be. So first I go out to find a location for the story I want to write a location that's easy to find, but has its own character. Then I will write a script based on the limitations of that environment. After that, I'll cast my actors, and after shooting these non-professionals, if they've deviated somewhat from the script, I must make final changes again to the script to cope with that during editing. That's why my films are unusually long, with a long production cycle which makes fundraising even harder. I can't tell my investors when the film will be finished, three months shooting or five months shooting. That's why each movie's cycle is so long. 
This is a habit I can't change. The second thing is about sound. I have my technical team. I have long-term partners, my sound recording team, my shooting team. Because I am an independent filmmaker, I must count my chips, know my strengths, what I have and what I can or cannot do. This is very important. I create a movie based on the strengths I have. So back to the sound question you mentioned earlier. I have my own sound team and studio to finish my movie. So for a 10 to 20 million Taiwanese dollar low budget movie, we can finish all sound production in-house except recording in Dolby. So I have to depend on my own team for everything. It's hard work. Talk to us a little bit uh, actually about how you think about sound in these environments, how you think about language, how you think about sound effects, and also the selection of music in your films. Hmm. Sound, to me, we go to see a movie, not listen to a movie. The sound is secondary. When we worked as production assistants early on, we saw the movie makers using sound as a transition to the next scene, even when the visual transition has difficulties. Now we are using sync sound. I record some sound myself. The location sound is actually an atmosphere, an emotion which affects the actors a great deal. In Taiwan, it is very difficult to shoot sync sound because we can't find a quiet environment. For example, currently I'm shooting a movie about a mute who is using sign language. Besides the environmental sound, there is only silence. So all sound treatments, including music and sound effects, are used to support watching the movie as secondary elements to the visual. Music for me, the last couple of films I made, I created the music first. Based on the music track, I changed the script plot. It's the opposite of what I used to do. I used to make a movie first and then find a composer to add music wherever it was needed. The last two movies I made, I created the music first. I first found a very precise soundtrack, and based on this music, I wrote the script. For example, my movie Feeling in Hand, I used the music to create the theme and the rhythm of the movie. I hope it will work. As far as sound effects, to be frank, Taiwan is not Hollywood. Our sound effects are weak. In a realistic environment, they are rarely used well. I often meet puzzled sound designers. For example, when we turn on a light, the sound designer always wants to add the ballast's starting sound for a fluorescent light. To me, in real life, you can't hear that sound. Should I emphasize the sound effect that much so you can hear z, z, z? It's a constant struggle for me. For example, my last movie had Japanese investors. They believed the fluorescent light being turned on must have sound, 100% audible, especially when actors have no dialogue. But in Taiwanese filmmaking, we generally ignore that sound. So we have to slowly accept their reality. This is my personal experience. In summary, the sound to me is secondary. The sound helps the audience to watch a movie 
and they unconsciously accept it as a part of the movie. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, how you became a filmmaker. Let's begin with just when you became interested in, in films. Was it in, in childhood? Was it later? What kinds of films interested you? How did you become fascinated by films? I never expected to become a film director. When I was very young, my father took me to see a Bruce Lee movie. At the cinema, almost everyone had a double stick in his hand. Wow, going to the movies is exciting. At the end of the movie, I saw Coke, soda, and garbage on the screen because people threw their garbage at the Japanese soldiers on the screen. That's the first movie I saw. It made a very deep impression on me. Later, I saw a lot of other movies. I majored in computer science. After I got my associate's degree, I went to serve in the military. While I was there, I met a colleague who was learning Italian so he could go to Italy to study painting. He said to me, I know that I chose my major late, but looking back at my past, I knew I had to change my career path now. He inspired me. We talked about career paths while we were at the Army's movie theater. In that theater, I watched a film made of three different reels. One was from a Western film from America, one from a Taiwan movie, and another was from a Kung Fu movie. The wrong reels had been put together, but nobody cared because soldiers there only wanted a place to smoke cigarettes. I watched the movie and was mesmerized by filmmaking. It was then I decided I wanted to be a cinematographer. After military service, I entered college to study the movie business. After college, I went to work on someone's film. A cameraman told me that to become a cinematographer, I would need to work for 15 years as the first assistant, then would be considered for a DP position. I realized I was 27 already, too late to be a cinematographer. Then another opportunity came. A movie director saw my thesis project. He was very impressed and offered me a job as his assistant director. So I began my career path as an assistant director. But I never thought about being a director. In our group, most first associate directors were over 50. One of them said to me, Little Chang, I have been working as an associate director for over 20 years and as a location note taker for 12 years. I started when I was 18. I thought about his words. I am close to 30. Another 30 years? I felt weak at the knees. So I decided to work as a career associate director. Being a first class AD is better than a third class director. That was Taiwanese cinema's high time, with many good directors like Ho Xiao Xian, director Yang. They were all in Hankou Street. Another place was Taiwan Central Motion Picture Company. I was running around in these two places for a long time. After a while, I realized as an AD, I couldn't go further, although an AD could make a lot of money. I had never written a script before. I said to myself, I'll try to write a script to reflect what's been on my mind for the first 30 years of my life. If the script doesn't come out, I would leave the movie industry for good. I forced myself to write it with a calligraphy brush. There was a contest for outstanding screenplay at the time. I handed in my first script called Gunshot at Midnight on the last day of the GIO's deadline. To my surprise, I won the top award of 300,000 Taiwanese dollars. That event changed my perception of myself. I may start to write another script for a film I want to shoot. Slowly, I made my way into directing. I never wanted to be a film director. I wanted to be a teacher. If I could pick a career, I would be a cinematographer. Let me just ask one final question. Um, 
and it's about two things that are happening right now, and I, as I want your response about the good and the bad that may affect you as a filmmaker and specifically a Taiwanese filmmaker. The two things. Globalization, you can see almost any movie anywhere on DVD. And the digital revolution. Therefore, an independent filmmaker like you can control so many more of your technical resources. So what is the good news about this for you as a filmmaker? And what is, is there any bad news? About the digital revolution, for an editor, the process is simpler and easier, and the working copy is closer to the final quality. The impact of the digital revolution on filmmakers and the film industry is not just good or bad. It depends on which part of the process you focus on. To me, digital technology should be used for the middle part of movie making, not at the beginning or end. Digital editing can reduce the cost and improve the communication among team members. As email has come along, few people still use a pen to write a letter. To me, it's not a matter of good or bad. It depends on the individual's need. There are a lot of people using HD to shoot a film. Actually, many years ago, people were using Super 8 to shoot a film, or using VHS, Betacam, or Digibeta. I think those programs look like film, but are not film. Film is optical, high quality, high level, at least the films I like. So when I shoot a TV series, I still shoot on 35mm film. I lost a lot of money by doing so. I believe in the future. It will be 100% digital. Nobody can resist that. But film is a high-class industry. It shouldn't become popular and ordinary. General projects everybody can shoot using digital. The movie industry should use film at the beginning and end, digital in the middle. Digital can shorten the production cycle, control the budget, and improve communication. The pros and cons of digital? I don't know. Like I said before, email now is very common, but I still write letters and mail them to my friend, not by email. Great. Thank you so much. Just hold on because we've run out of, of time, I'm very sorry to say. If you'd like more information about City Cinema Tech, about this series, or more generally about CUNY TV, it should be no surprise that the best way to get that information is by the internet. Please visit us at www.cuny.tv. Mr. Chang, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is uh, to chat with you. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule here in, in Taipei. And I know that, uh, like myself, all of our viewers uh, look forward to seeing your next film, uh, Butterfly, which is the one about the mute, not the one about the, uh, the, blind, uh, the, the blind people. Thank you, in any case, for joining us today. And thank you for joining us as City Cinema Tech takes a visit to Taipei, Taiwan. And please join us again as we stroll through the archives of film history. Bye-bye for now.
The preceding presentation was made possible, in part, by support from the Press Division and Taipei Cultural Center of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in New York and by the Government Information Office in Taiwan.